guys. <laughs> it's a snowy, gloomy day and the kids are out of school, so I needed a space where I could come share this week's video message. So here I am in the car. <laughs> it works. So today there's a few things that I want to talk about with you guys. And so I think I'm going to start by talking about some things that have been in the news, going over some screenshots, some repeating messages and patterns that I've been noticing. And I'm gonna talk about kind of what's going on out in the world, and then I'm gonna bring it back and talk about some awesome things that I'm noticing that the Lord is doing. So <laughs> we're gonna start with the heavier stuff and end on a positive note, like we always do. <laughs> so, in the last video message, I talked about this pattern that I had noticed all at the beginning of the year, all on the same day, all of these stories about murder suicides with families. Well, after I put out that video, the very next day, there was another murder suicide in the news with a family. Here's a screenshot. And I've noticed since then, it seems to be that every time I look at the news or turn on the radio or the TV, I'm constantly hearing about people who are passing away. It's all the time. And it seems like years ago, it was just once in a great while you would hear a story or even hear about someone in your close community who passed away. It happened every now and then, but it feels like now in the year 2023 and, and leading up to it, it seems to be every day somebody's passing away every day. I talk to my kids and every day they're telling me my friend's mom just unexpectedly passed away. My friend's little brother just unexpectedly passed away this week. In fact, I remember towards the end of 2022, right before one of my videos, I didn't share it, but a local news reporter reached out to me for a story he was doing and we chatted, he put out the story, and then just a week or two later, he unexpectedly passed away. What's crazy is a lot of these people are passing away from heart attacks and cardiac arrest, things that are just really sudden and fatal. And even sudden funerals that I've attended recently were also because of heart attacks. And it just seems to be a focus on our hearts. Again, I talked about in the last video message how it feels like the war right now, the battle that's going on between good versus evil, really is just a battle for our hearts. Because if the adversary can get to our heart, he can steal our soul. We always hear about the battle of good versus evil being a battle over souls, which it is. But the battle leading up to that battle is a battle for our heart. Because if the adversary can get to our heart, then he can get to our soul. And speaking of hearts, I'm still seeing them all the time. It almost feels like so many people are leaving the earth right now. So many people are passing away because the Lord is about to meet the bride. And some people are so distracted right now with Babylon, um, whether they're caught up in addictions or just too many distractions that are overwhelming them from being able to hear the voice of the Lord. It almost seems like them being called home is a blessing because they're being removed from these earthly distractions so they can be better taught the gospel and the things of the Lord so that they can have an opportunity to possibly be a part of all of this. And, and those who are on the path who are being called home are clearly needed on the other side to assist with all of these other children of God who are being prepared to be taught the gospel. It's hastening on both sides of the veil. And so as quickly as people are being taken home, right? It feels like the space between that and the Lord coming for his bride, the Lord returning, is just going to be at the blink of an eye, right? Believing that can only give us hope during these times that we're living in right now. So as I was pondering about this, I was driving the other day in my car and this song came on that I had never heard before. In fact, it was somebody else doing a cover song of the song called Jesus Isn't in LA by Alec Benjamin. I'd never heard of the song before, but I'm listening to the words and they grab my attention because it's something I think about often. It's something that I hear about often. I've shared in these videos before. 
And then here I am hearing somebody actually singing about it on the radio. And then I look at the title on the screen of my car and it says, Jesus isn't in LA. So it caught my attention. So I looked up the words and I want to share them with you. Well, I shook hands with the devil down on the south side and he bought us both a drink with a pad and a pencil sat by his side. I said, tell me what you think. I've been looking for my savior, looking for my truth. I even asked my shrink. He brought me down to his level and said, son, you're not special. You won't find him where you think. You won't find him down on sunset or at a party in the hills, at the bottom of the bottle, or when you're tripping on some pills. When they sold you the dream, you were just 16, packed a bag and ran away. And it's a crying shame you came all this way because you won't find Jesus in LA. Took a sip of his whiskey, said, now that you're with me, well, I think that you should stay. Yeah, I know you've been busy searching through the city, so let me share the way. I know I'm not your savior. No, I'm not your truth. But I think we could be friends. He said, come down to my level. Hang out with the devil. Let me tell you in the end. You won't find him down on sunset or at a party in the hills, at the bottom of the bottle, or when you're tripping on some pills. When they sold you the dream, you were just 16, packed a bag and ran away, and it's a crying shame you came all this way because you won't find Jesus in L.A. And that's when I knew that it was time to go home. And that is when I realized that I was alone. And all the vibrant colors from the lights fade away. And I don't care what they say. Then he repeats how you won't find Jesus in L.A. <laughs> so... Anyways, this song caught my attention because I remember a few years ago when I first heard this song on the radio that caught my attention. It was a real simple singer-songwriter acoustic song by this kid named Alec Benjamin. I'd never heard of him before. He was new and I loved his song and I came home and shared it with my kids. I remember thinking, wow, he is really talented the way he can write and sing. He's got a bright future ahead of him. <laughs> and then I realized... I haven't heard much from him lately. It seems like he's been missing in action. So when I saw his name on the radio and I saw the title of that song, it caught my attention. And as I read the words, clearly that's his story. He's telling us that he wanted to be discovered. So he went to LA and met with somebody from a record label. They promised him this bright, sparkly package, but in essence, he would be signing a deal with the devil. And when you sign a deal with the devil, you are expected to eliminate Jesus out of your life. Now, I keep hearing about this. I keep seeing celebrity testimonials about this. It just keeps popping up everywhere. And I've heard about this and I've known about this for the past few years. But right now, it seems to be coming up more than ever. And we've seen a lot of celebrities in that industry, especially the music industry, who finally decide to take that leap because they want to advance their career. They sign that deal. And then when they realize what is expected of them, what's required of them, a lot of times they have a mental and emotional breakdown and they completely lose their identity. They're basically forsaking their faith, stepping into this new church, the church of the devil. We read about it in the scriptures. And this is who they have to worship now. These are the things they have to participate in. And there's different levels within this church. And in order to achieve fame and success and recognition, especially within your industry, you have to go through these rituals and rites. You have to enter into these covenants. It, it really is a religion and it is so broad. It expands through so many industries. It goes by so many names, but at the top, the founder of it all is the devil himself. And the scriptures talk all about this. His tentacles reach out to so many industries, whether it's music, entertainment, sports, journalism, the tech industry, social media. <laughs> I mean, it is just crazy. And so this poor kid who had a dream he was hopeful and admits he was a little naive, ran away from home, which tells me he went against his parents' 
advice and wisdom, went out to LA on his own. And when he got there, he realized he really was on his own. He really was alone. If you are in that industry and you don't subscribe to that religion, you are alone. You have no one in your corner. You have no platform. You win no awards. You don't get that recognition, that advancement in your career, even if you're super talented, if you don't join that church. The youth of our generation today are so fixed on becoming famous, becoming discovered. It's that era of me, 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 right? Selfies and trying to see how many likes and views you can get on TikTok. Trying to get that moment in the spotlight. Kids these days will do anything to get that attention, to get discovered. And Satan knows that. He also knows that this is a pretty powerful generation. On the earth at this time, they have a really important role that they play in these last days, especially the youth of the church. And I think sometimes we forget that when the Lord gives us a talent, right? He gives us things that we're good at and passionate about. If we consecrate it over to him, we submit to his will. He will show us the plans that he has. He will show us how he can use us. He gave us our gifts and our talents for a reason, and he has a plan. But when we try to go around that and do it our own way, submit to our own will, and we become so desperate to be successful in whatever it is we're doing that we're willing to give a little here and there with our faith and our beliefs and our principles, then the adversary swoops in and says, hey, I recognize that you are super talented. I can take your career to the next level. If you sign this contract right here and do a deal with me, you'll be going places. And of course, in the fine print, it says, but you have to do things my way, my will, my doctrine, my agenda, my principles. And if you sign those deals and those contracts and you realize later that that's not for you and you have regrets, there are a lot of penalties and consequences laid out. And a lot of people realize they are stuck. They are prisoners, slaves to the industry, to the adversary, as they're being controlled and told what to do, what messages to put out, what songs to sing, what artists to collaborate with, what movie roles to be in whether it goes against their values or not, what political agenda they need to support, what political candidates they need to back up and be vocal about. That's why when you go to these award shows and people get up to accept their awards, a lot of times they will use that as a moment and a platform to spit out a political agenda and quickly promote some cause that they're standing behind or something very political. It's because it's all a part of the package. It's all a part of the deal, the contract. And those who don't want to do that lose out on opportunities in their industry. They lose movie roles. They don't win awards. They're pulled away from the spotlight. And speaking of this topic, this popped up this week. So Brendan Fraser is known to be somebody who was abused by the industry. And he has um, kind of a crazy history. It's it's kind of sad, but he was having wonderful success with his acting career. And then something happened. He was physically assaulted and sexually abused by the guy at the top of, of the movie industry at the time. And it was at an award show. And he was so devastated and humiliated that it took an emotional toll on him. And he sort of spoke about it, but then was blacklisted from Hollywood forever, just seemed like forever. And he never got any more acting roles. He went into like a depression, kind of disappeared for a while. And all of these years later, he has resurfaced and he was given an opportunity through Netflix. It seems like Netflix has been kind of like a a little bit of a saving grace for, for actors. It's a company that doesn't seem to require the actors and actresses and producers and whatnot to, I guess you could say, bargain with the devil. (laughs) So they are independent. However, I still think everybody in that industry at some point kind of crosses a line and rubs elbows with somebody and gets pulled into that great and abominable church. So I can't really speak for Netflix. I, I, 
I don't know that anybody in the industry is really completely separate from all of that, even though they are independent. Um, however, I will say that Brendan Fraser seems to have been given this opportunity and to act in a role that he was pleased to perform in, and he ended up receiving an award because of it. And this video of his award speech, um, he's just crying tears of joy and relief and just talking about how there was hope for him and how difficult his journey was, how he thought his acting career was over, but somebody believed in him and he was given an opportunity and and now he was receiving an award because of his performance in that role in his new movie. So there was like a standing ovation in the audience. All the celebrities, especially those who are a part of that great and abominable church, were crying. I think they understood what he was talking about and they realized that he had sort of gone around the system, that he was able to stay true to himself and stay true to who he was and stand up against the people in Hollywood um, who were a part of the great and abominable church, who were who were causing harm and abusing their positions and power. He stood up against that and it cost him his career, but now he's been able to come back and um, he still has stayed outside of that great and abominable church. And I think the celebrities in Hollywood were proud of him because I think, you know, they understand, they understand what goes on because they're, they're a part of it. They witness it all the time and they themselves are in these contracts and they have these requirements they have to meet. And I think that they were just so happy for him that he was able to find a way um, around the system, that he was able to to escape all of that and resurrect his career. And there wasn't a dry eye in that room. So I noticed on that screenshot, there was that pay attention number 144, which represents the gathering, the gathering of Israel. And in that room at that award show, all of these Actors and actresses and producers had gathered together. They were all in the same building and they were listening to this testimony of this man who has escaped the great and abominable church. And he's now being recognized and praised by the people who are prisoners and slaves in that church. I think to them, it's kind of this hero story. It's kind of like, I don't know, it reminds me of Moses. He's sort of like a Moses of Hollywood. He's showing people you don't have to be a slave to the industry, be a slave to this church. You can escape that and there's a better way and you can come out on top and be blessed because of it. Now, right at this time when I was recording this part of the video, there was a 6.1 magnitude earthquake in Indonesia. <laughs> so um, again, another shaking and it just really screamed, pay attention. Now, this was on my mind again recently because a friend of mine pointed out to me, it's the end of last year, something had caught her attention. Shania Twain had signed to a new record label, which was going to relaunch her career. And with this new record label and deal that she signed, it is promising her advancement in her career at her age. People have said to her, you're at that age where you should just be a grandma enjoying your grandkids. You know what? Is the motivation behind what it is you're doing and she has recently said in interviews i want to be empowered and i want to show the world that just because you're older like me and you're a woman you still have value and you can still wow people and you can still be beautiful and feel beautiful so she's been doing these photo shoots completely nude and people are asking her about that. Why would you do that? And why would you do that at your age? And that's usually not something typical in the country music industry. And she's saying, well, I want to be the person who kind of paves the way for that. And I want to empower women my age and have them feeling comfortable in their skin so they can be nude if they want to be nude and feel good about it. And so she's sending this message to women, women in the country music industry, women her age, sending this message that your career never has to be over and you don't have to feel washed up. You can relaunch your career and become edgier and throw off all the clothes <laughs> and that will advance your career. And so what's interesting is my friend pointed out that this record label that just signed her on is brand new in the country music industry. It's Republic Records. Now they're known for signing artists such as Taylor Swift and The Weeknd and so many others. But this is the first time they've opened up a division in Nashville in the country music industry. So they used her 
as their first artist to sign on under that label in the country music industry. And it was interesting, my friend pointed out how when she had her first performance, here's some images right here. The camera zoomed in on the Kardashians who were in the audience. I think it was like the, the People's Choice Awards. And I think that was intentional because they are such a powerful family in that industry, in that great and abominable church. So their approval, their visible approval on camera is going to do a lot for someone else's reputation and career. And every time they would show these sexy images of Shania on the stage, the camera would pan over to the Kardashians and they would be clapping along and cheering her along and singing her songs. My friend pointed out to me in that video, if you watch her performance, it really does look like a ceremony. You look at it and you see the golden calf. You see those images right here. You've got the golden calf. They are hanging all around the stage and they're gold and shiny. You have the fire and the flames. You have the woman in red. You have the woman riding the beast. And then you have this removal of clothing through the performance. And in this image right here, she's wearing these chaps and she has on this nude sheer leotard underneath so that it looks like she's completely nude in the front and the back and all she has on is chaps and everybody's screaming and cheering and you have the flames and the fire shooting up. It's very seductive, it's, it's dark, you have the black and the red. And so we've seen this before with Taylor Swift, with Katy Perry, even with The Weeknd at those Super Bowl performances. And we always see it at a time when these stars are ready to advance their career to the next level. So it's sort of like a ceremonial initiation. You do this and these are the rewards that you receive. And so you'll notice, we've talked about this before in past videos over the years, the year that Taylor Swift signed to this same record label, Republic Records, that was the year she came out with this album and this performance right here that made waves and won her a ton of awards. Again, you see the fiery flames, you see the removal of clothing, you see the woman in red. It's sort of like this initiation. <laughs> Every time you see an artist do this, you'll notice shortly after they're winning best album of the year, best performer of the year, best female or male vocalist of the year. They're in the spotlight all year. Now there are artists who go through these different levels and they get to a point where they are asked to do something that they are not comfortable with that really digs at their soul. From everything I have heard coming from their own testimonials, a lot of them can't say very much because they are not allowed to. They do it in a very covert way. A lot of these celebrities say, I've seen so many things, I've experienced so many things, but I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it, my hands are tied. Or if I talk about it, I'm gonna be in trouble. It's part of those covenants that they make. Once you enter this covenant, you can't speak about it or there's a penalty you'll have to pay, a very high price. And I remember recently, just to give an example, I remember Coolio had come out last year and shared a lot of this stuff and exposed a lot of the dark side of the industry. And the people who were talking with him said, well, aren't you worried about your life right now? And he said, yeah, something could happen to me. If something happens to me, you'll know why. And shortly after that, he had a heart attack and he passed away. And I remember sharing years ago when I did that Halloween video and I shared testimony from John Ramirez, who is a man who used to be a former high priest in the satanic occult. And it was for generations. It was his father and his grandfather. It just went back generations. That was their church. That was their religion. It was very important to them. And they took it very seriously. And he talked about all the time that whenever somebody did them wrong or broke an agreement or didn't come through on their end with something, if that person wasn't protected by the power of Christ, if they weren't a Christian or a believer and they weren't praying, these were usually people that were involved in crime. They had the power and authority to send dark forces after these people, politicians, people in their city, members of the mafia, they could send these powers of darkness after these people to take their lives. And they were never held accountable. They were never arrested or charged because there was no connections to these deaths because it was all done 
through dark supernatural forces that they had authority over because they were working with high levels of darkness. It was a part of their church. They made these covenants, they offered sacrifices, and in return they had this power where they could command darkness to do their bidding, but really the bidding that they were doing was the devil's bidding because he was at the top and he is who they worshiped. And so these powers of darkness could go after anybody and suddenly there was a mysterious car accident and they passed away or they had a heart attack while they were in the shower and they passed away. And he said the most common way people would die was car accident or heart attack. And so it's interesting when you see a lot of these celebrities who die in such a similar pattern, dying in a hotel room, drowning in a bathtub. We just keep seeing it over and over. And we have seen so many in the last couple of months, especially last year, so many. And a lot of these people, these celebrities who have recently passed away in a similar pattern were people who were starting to make waves and talk about things they weren't supposed to talk about because they were bothered by it. They were upset with it and they felt like they finally needed to say something and expose it. And as soon as they started talking, they met their fate. So I keep seeing this over and over. This just keeps popping up. And to me, it's a reminder of how the adversary mimics what it is that the Lord does. But with the Lord, we are promised life and blessings and happiness and joy. And it's lasting. It's eternal. As we do his will, he blesses us with happiness and joy and healing and all of these wonderful things. And as I've talked about before, the adversary tries to do the same thing, but it's very depleting. It's not long lasting happiness. It's temporary and you have to keep giving more and more sacrifice to keep getting more and more temporary happiness back. It's a worldly kind of happiness. It's a very selfish and self-centered kind of happiness. It's not joy and you're not free. You're told what you have to do. You lose your identity and you are given an identity that doesn't feel like you. And so you're constantly at odds with it and clashing with it. And it's enough to drive a lot of people psychologically mad. <laughs> it's very common to see people in this industry have emotional and mental breakdowns, shave their hair off, kind of just go off the deep end and have a complete crisis because they're experiencing all of these things that go against their core values and beliefs that go, go against who they are on the inside. And they feel like there's nothing they can do about it. Their hands are tied. They've signed the deal. They're not allowed to talk about it. So they can't deal with it, process it because they're not allowed to talk about it, but they have to keep participating in it. And it involves a lot of really dark things that are the opposite of what Christ stands for. People just go into that world and they get completely lost. They lose their identity. They feel like they've lost their soul. They feel like there's no hope. And it's just this downward spiral. And it always ends the same for everyone who goes down that path. In fact, I remember if you look it up, there's a video interview of Bob Dylan on 2020 shortly before he passed away and he just went and exposed it in that interview and then he passed away and he talked about how he has absolutely zero talent. Um, he was being asked by the interviewer, so, you know, how come you're not writing songs right now? You know, how come you're not keeping this going? And he basically said, I signed a deal with the devil. That wasn't my talent. That wasn't me. When I signed that deal, something entered into me and suddenly I could sing and I could write music and I don't even know where it was coming from. He called it a dark, magical force that entered inside of him and suddenly he had all these talents and abilities and he could sing and write and perform. But when he was on that stage and when he was in the studio, that was somebody else. It wasn't him. And as soon as they were done with him and he was sort of washed up, they didn't need him anymore. He lost his abilities. He couldn't sing. He couldn't perform. He couldn't write because that wasn't even him. And so he admitted in that interview, they asked him, who, who is it you're talking about? And he said, oh, you know, he said, I did a deal with, you know, who with him, with the big guy. And, um, he had regrets about it. He said he didn't feel it was worth it. And he looked really lost and really sad. And then shortly after he spilled the beans on that, he passed away. It's the opposite with the Lord. When you enter covenants with the Lord, you are on a path that leads to life, life eternal. 
happiness and joy beyond what you can imagine. It's not a selfish, self-centered path. It's very much the opposite. You're giving to everyone. You're loving everyone. It's a lot of selflessness, self-sacrifice, giving up things to bless other people. The Lord's path is a path of freedom. The adversary's path is a path of bondage. You are not free. You feel like a slave. You feel like you're being told what to do. You're in chains. You have handlers. You have people that control your career and control your life, control who you date, who you can marry. Every aspect of your life, if you can have kids, when you can have kids, how many kids, all of that. Um, as you advance your career and you advance along his path, at each level, the higher you climb, it requires a lot more sacrifice to bring you some temporary worldly happiness, but in the long run is void and empty of any happiness or joy. You completely lose your true identity of who you really are and you become lost. And everybody who seems to go down that path reaches a point in their life where they say, I have regrets. It wasn't worth it. I feel empty. I feel hollow. Yes, I've achieved all of the success and fame and all of these awards, but for what? For what? And um, in fact, there are instances where these celebrities will go through all the hoops in their contract and do what it is they're supposed to do to advance their career. But if there's one thing they do that goes against the contract or they do something that's displeasing to the people above, um, it'll cost them. So here's an example of that. Um, the Weekend Blast Corrupt Grammy Awards after shocking shout out. You owe me, my fans, and the industry transparency. So based on sales and streams, he had had the most successful pop album that year. And everybody was expecting him to win all of these awards. Even he was, and probably because he was doing what he was supposed to do to advance his career and expected to receive those awards. And for some reason or another, he was completely snubbed by the Grammy Awards. And so he didn't receive one award. So he was very upset about that. And he decided he was going to boycott the Grammys. And he's kept to his word ever since. So at the following award show, he actually did receive a nomination and an award. And he was not there to receive it. But it was an award for someone else's album that he had done a collaboration on. And so leading up to that award, he also did that performance at the Super Bowl where he had all of the symbols. He had the black and the red and he had the demon with the red glowing eyes. He he had, you know, sort of played the game of the contract to advance his career and still hadn't received any awards. And so this is probably why he was upset because he was, you know, if you look at it at a, a religious point of view, from a religious point of view, he was keeping his covenants and not receiving the blessings. So he was very upset and decided to turn against the industry. And then after he did that and was very public about it, then they gave him an award and he did not show up to receive it. But it just goes to show you um, that's how it is in this church. Even as you advance in these covenants, you're not always guaranteed the quote-unquote blessings or rewards. So after that award show, he called the Grammys corrupt, and he told the New York Times, because of the secret committees, I will no longer allow my label to submit my music to the Grammys. And so when I heard secret committees, I heard secret combinations. So that reads a little bit differently when you read it that way. Because of the secret combinations, I will no longer allow my label to submit my music to the Grammys. He has kept true to his word and hasn't submitted solo music for consideration since his 2022 album. That just keeps coming up a lot lately. Seems like there's a lot of movies that have been coming out. You know, Elvis, Whitney Houston. I think there was one last year for Marilyn Monroe. All of these legends from over the years that a lot of people idolize and want to be like and want to meet them and are in love with their music and, you know, um, really put these people on a pedestal. But really, when you look at their lives and you examine it under a magnifying glass, you see how unhappy these people were, how they weren't free. They were very much controlled. Their life felt very empty and hollow and void of happiness and joy. And eventually they died in a very sad way. 
this message just keeps coming across my path. So I felt the need to share it again in this video message to just remember to put your focus on things that are eternal, things that are lasting, which of course are things of Christ. When you anchor yourself in him and you put your feet on his path, you're not going to be alone. You're not going to feel lost and confused empty and hollow. Those feelings come from the adversary. And oftentimes when he sees us on the path that leads to Christ, he's going to do everything he can to pull us off of that path. And there's only one other path. There is no in between. And we know that that other path leads to him. So if you ever start feeling those feelings in your life, just know that they don't come from the Lord. They're not from him. I think we're all at a point right now where just about everybody would agree that this battle of good versus evil that's happening in the physical and in the spiritual is really being felt. It's it's really noticeable. It seems like years ago, people would be like, oh, you know, that's crazy talk or something that religious nuts and fanatics focus on, right? <laughs> Like life is meant to be enjoyed and these are all things that we're just enjoying and it seems like now everybody's starting to see it and feel it more and more that these things are real. There really is a battle of good versus evil that's happening right now. That's a battle for men's hearts, a battle for souls, and we're feeling it stronger than ever right now. It's really manifesting on both sides of the veil and having an impact on everyone. And it feels like things are really speeding up right now. Um, I talked about this in recent videos that, you know, things that I used to ponder and wonder about, it seemed like I could never really get answers or I just didn't know. And I would just have to put it on a shelf and wait for some future day <laughs> when all things would be revealed. And it feels like that now those questions are coming back off the shelf. And the day that they come off the shelf, they are getting instant answers. Things are falling into my path that are just filling in all the gaps and the holes, which is amazing. It's just increasing my testimony and my faith. I'm also seeing that with miracles. I've talked about that in recent videos, how I've noticed that people who drop to their knees and pray for a miracle are getting miracles pretty quick, where it seems like in the past it took a lot longer. and everything just seemed to take longer, but now it feels like things are really picking up. And I've heard a lot of talk lately too about people just saying that time is going by so fast, including myself and my husband and my kids. We are all in agreement that it just feels like the days are flying by and there isn't enough time to do all of the things we used to be able to do in a day. It just seems like it's just not able to happen anymore. And so we're having to even be more smart with prioritizing our time because it just feels like the days are getting shorter and shorter. Time is just going by so fast. A funny example of that with my family, my sister was sharing this story with me of how last week my dad lost his passport and he couldn't find it and he and his wife were getting ready to go to Mexico the next day. He was in a panic. He called her, was telling her about it. He had torn his house apart looking for it and was getting close to just canceling the trip because you can't go if you don't have a passport. And she said to him, well, dad, have you prayed about it? <laughs> And he said, oh, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So she said, why don't you go pray about it? And she said that he went and said a prayer. And right after he prayed, instantly a thought came into his mind, a picture of where the passport might be. It was in this folder. So he immediately went and found that folder that was alphabetized. And he went through it and he went to P for passport. And there it was. And, and I think sometimes we, we forget that that can be the first thing that we do before we stress over our problems and get to that point where we feel so hopeless. Instead of waiting to get to that point to take it to the Lord, we just don't have time for that these days. Time's really going by so fast. It's, it's running out. We should be going to the Lord first for everything, and he will answer right away, just like he did for my dad. So I love that. That was a beautiful reminder. And then my sister shared with me another little experience that she had um, over the holiday break. Um, she was wanting to give a Christmas present to her son and his wife, but she had run out of money, and she really just wanted to give them $50. 
and even a $50 gift card to their favorite restaurant, which is Texas Roadhouse, would be ideal. And she just had a quick little prayer in her heart. The jets are flying over. <laughs> She just had this quick little prayer in her heart that she could find a way to give her son and her daughter-in-law a Christmas present of $50. Well, right after she had that quick little prayer in her heart, she went downstairs and started cleaning. And all of a sudden, right there in front of her, she found a $50 gift card to Texas Roadhouse. She couldn't believe it. But then again, she could <laughs> because that's how amazing the Lord is. He heard her little prayer in her heart and it was important to him because it was important to her. And he answered immediately. That was divine intervention, placing a $50 gift card right in front of her in her basement for her son's favorite restaurant. It was amazing. And she was so grateful and right away expressed that gratitude to the Lord. That's how amazing he is. And even things that are so little that we feel like, oh, I shouldn't pray about that. That's such a trivial little thing. If it's important to us, it's important to him. And he has that ability. He has that power to grant those blessings and those miracles. And I think sometimes we feel bad or we feel guilty asking, but we should be. And in fact, President Nelson has encouraged us to start asking and believing for more miracles in our lives. So as much as we feel all this heaviness and darkness that's hastening in the devil's kingdom with his church, right? We know how that's going to end. But if we turn our focus over to the Lord and his church and his kingdom and what he's doing, we can see just as much how that is hastening and how amazing that feels to be a part of that and put our focus on that. So all of these things are speeding up. Things that we had heard about in the past Sorry, the jets are pretty loud. <laughs> but things that were forecasted that just seemed so far into the future, they are all happening right now in our day. We used to hear about something like, oh, scientists are working on this or research is being done on that. And it just seemed like it took forever. It took years and years and years. And we would just kind of put it to the back of our mind. But right now, when somebody comes out and says, scientists are working on this or researchers are looking into this, it literally seems like days later and suddenly there's a cure um, or there's this breakthrough and it's just happening so fast. So I noticed that all in one day I got these news alerts that popped up. This story about this cure for cancer, which is basically gene editing, where they can go in and edit your genetic coding. So if there's something that's off with your body, whether it's cancer or an autoimmune disorder, they will go in and correct your programming and coding within your genes, and then the cancer goes away. The autoimmune disorder corrects itself, it reverses. And so the same day that these stories broke and were everywhere, how they've been using this breakthrough research and technology to cure cancer in children, especially fatal cancers, where these patients were given just a few weeks to live. They try out this gene editing and now their cancer is completely gone. That same day, a news story breaks out and I get a, an alert on my phone for this cure for aging, where now people no longer need to age. They are able to reverse that. It reminds me of that movie, Benjamin Button. <laughs> I haven't really looked into this, so I don't know the stipulations of it. It seems like when things like this come out, there are a lot of um, bureaucrats that kind of jump on it and put the red tape around it and say, nope, you can't do that because if suddenly there's a cure for cancer and there's a cure for all of these other diseases and disorders, then all of these industries that make a ton of money off of chemotherapy and radiation and all of these other treatments, suddenly they're not needed. And overnight, they lose money. And those industries close down. Those companies shut down. Those medications aren't needed. Um, as long as people are needing medication and chemotherapy and radiation and all of these other treatments, somebody's making a lot of money off of that. So it seems like when, when things like this come out, when, when somebody's discovered free energy, so we no longer need energy the way that we're getting it. <laughs> Somebody comes in and shuts that down right away. These people disappear. We no longer hear about it. Um, we're used to seeing that happen over the years because if we're not dependent on oil and electricity, the way that we're getting it, all of these things that we are so dependent upon, somebody's not going to be getting rich at the top. So I wondered when these came out, I thought, oh, if people are no longer 
going to be aging? Are they not, are they not going to be dying? And if we can edit people's genes, are they going to live for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years if they're not killed in a car accident or some other way? It's just crazy to see that we are at that point where these things are happening. In fact, there is a video that popped up. I'll have a link to a lot of this down below and I didn't have time to really watch it, but it was all about the AI technology coming to 2023. All of this artificial intelligence, I think they were saying that 2023 is really the year for artificial intelligence. It's like skyrocketing right now. We are becoming so dependent upon it and it's really becoming a part of our everyday life. And it's interesting because that topic kept coming up for me the last couple of months, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, just constantly coming up for me. And when you think about those words, artificial intelligence, well, artificial means imitation, right? Sort of like a counterfeit, imitation. It's not the real thing. And then you have the word intelligence. And when you read about intelligence in the scriptures, we are all intelligence. We are real. <laughs> we are sons and daughters of God. We are his children. We come from him. We are intelligence. And so when you hear of artificial intelligence, it just reminds me again of the counterfeit. Everything the adversary is trying to do to imitate and copy what it is that the Lord is doing, but it's not the same. So I keep hearing 2023 is the year for artificial intelligence. We are just going to see amazing breakthroughs throughout this year. And by December of this year, we're going to look back at the beginning of this year and, and just be blown away at all the advancements and progress that are going to happen as the months go on. And then last month, there was the story of this new technology that's coming where you can grow your children in a lab. You don't have to be pregnant with them. You don't have to take on those costs. You don't have to get stretch marks and have the quote unquote inconvenience of carrying a baby in your body. You can have it grown in a lab and you can decide what the baby looks like. If it's a girl, if it's a boy, what genes you want it to have. Um, you can decide everything about it. So basically play the role of God for a pretty penny and you're able to see the baby and interact with it and follow its development and its health issues while it's in the womb through an app on your phone. And just this day and age that we're living in, it's just unreal. It's crazy. And it just feels like as these stories keep coming out, um, even though it sounds so amazing to the world that we have the capability of doing all of these things, at the same time, it just feels so wrong and feels um, very much the opposite of the Lord's plans of his ways, right? It seems to go against his will. And so it reminds me of the Tower of Babel, how people were building that tower to get to God. And a lot of times when I think about that story, I just want to say over the years, as I pondered on that story in the Old Testament, I think to myself, those people had to have been pretty unintelligent <laughs> to think they could build a tower that high that it would go all the way up into, um, space, you know, beyond this planet and reach the place where God dwells. If they really believe that, that they had to have not been very intelligent, right? And, and you could look at that and say, well, but it was about their hearts because their hearts believed that they could do that, that they could stack bricks high enough. They could make it all the way to heaven, right? Because that's where their heart was. The Lord needed to do something about that because, um, that wasn't good and it was affecting a whole generation and the next generations to come. But as I have pondered on that a lot lately, especially over the last year when we studied the Old Testament, I started to wonder if maybe there was more to it and there's just not a lot of detail in those scriptures about it, that maybe this tower was symbolic. Maybe it was a headquarters or a place where they were doing things idolizing things, worshiping things, creating things that went against everything that he is about and everything that he's doing. It almost makes sense that this tower wasn't just a tower trying to get to God, but the things that they were doing, obviously the place where their heart was at, but the things that they were participating in, thinking that they could reach God in their own way, not through the plan that the Lord has laid out for us, that he's laid out for all of his children all throughout time. Ever since Adam and Eve, he has always laid out a plan for how his children can reach him. He's laid out the path. He's showed us how to do it through scriptures and prophets all throughout time. 
And it seems to me that these people were trying to reach God in their own way, doing it their own way, going outside of his plans, whatever that looked like at that time. And I feel like the, the tower was just a symbol of that, right? But truly that was Babylon. And we know that Babylon, the world, today we see it all the time that there are so many people who promote ways to be happy and to find yourself and discover your identity and reach God and be with him. And it's through another way. It's not through covenants. It's not through the covenant path. It's through another way. In fact, I've talked about that in past videos, but it seems to be more and more of an up and coming topic lately, especially in that whole world of Babylon. There are a lot of celebrities that promote this and a lot of influencers on social media who are promoting this. I've even known a lot of people over the years who left the church because of this, because they wanted to have a relationship with the Lord and have these through the veil experiences in their own way, not the Lord's way. Whether it's through new age stuff or psychedelics, substances, other churches and religions where people are given these tools and they're told if you do these meditations, if you take these substances, if you do this deep breathing and listen to this music or listen to these tones or go into the salt mine or whatever it is, right? You can have these experiences where you leave your body and you go on these journeys and you're greeted by these spirit guides and you meet ancestors on the other side of the veil who help you work out your issues in life and help you heal and forgive. And you might run into your grandpa or you might run into a guardian angel, right? Whoever it is, there's this great love for you and it's so easy to access and everyone's doing it and they're all having these amazing experiences and breakthroughs and people are healing and they're finding themselves and they're saying that they're so happy and their depression's going away, whatever it is, right? You just keep hearing this over and over. And I talked about it a few years ago. I did some videos exposing all of that, but I've been seeing it more and more lately. It almost seems right now to be louder than it's ever been before. You just see so many people going off of the path to go this way, trying out these sparkly packages to see what's inside of them, which is, which is interesting because some people will say, well, it just feels like too much work to have to do things the Lord's way because you have to serve and sacrifice and give of your time and your talents and, and all of these things to build up his kingdom, to receive those blessings, to have those experiences. But you look at over here and you look at these people who are spending hours upon hours in their closets meditating for hundreds and thousands of dollars to go to these spas and clinics to have these treatments or, or go to these retreats where they're taught these methods and modalities of things that they can do to tap into the supernatural and have these beyond the veil experiences where they find their inner self or whatever it is. They go on these journeys and they discover their identity and they have healing and, and all of these wonderful things that are promised to them. And what's interesting is it's sort of like this revolving door. They put out all this money, they invest all of this time into these people and into these clinics and businesses and, and life coaches into this world, but it seems like it's never really a fix for them. For a moment, they find some happiness and they feel really excited. They feel like they have this new team of people and support in their corner, but then over time, it's just this revolving door. They keep having bouts of depression and sadness, and sometimes it seems to be even worse than it was before they went down that path into that world. And you start to see extremes happening in their life, whether it's with dieting or a new belief or a practice that they're trying out, they take it really extreme and it seems to just kind of like consume them. It becomes their whole world. It, it becomes their identity. And instead of talking about family history work, right? And going to the temple and ministering and all of these wonderful things that we should be doing that are going to bring us closer to the Lord and help us be secure in our identity in Christ, right? These things that bring us these amazing blessings and miracles every day in our life. They're seeking these same things in their own way, on their own terms, right? Not the Lord's way, not on the Lord's terms. And it almost seems to be more complicated. The gospel is very simple. The plan of salvation is very simple. It's so easy to understand. It's so easy to follow. It's so simple. 
and the world, Babylon, the church of the devil, all of that stuff, it is so much more complicated. It makes your life so much more difficult. All of these things that you think you're going to get out of it, you find yourself actually being depleted of those things. And so you become even more desperate to have that happiness and that healing and, and peace of mind that you start to do things even more extreme to get that, right? Where over here, the Lord's way is a path of peace. You don't feel the need to do things in extremes because the Lord is with you. You feel his power in your life every day. You see it working. It's free to do these things. It doesn't require special training or certifications or expert gurus or expensive doctors, expensive practitioners and life coaches to guide you to that happiness. It's all laid out right before you. And the gifts that you're given to help you along that path, those gifts are free and they're instant. You don't have to memorize mantras or sit in your closet for hours meditating. You don't have to put substances into your body to have these miraculous experiences. It's really so simple and the blessings are so surreal and so incredible. And it's crazy to see how so many people don't want to put their faith in that and don't want to give it a try or feel like it's too hard and this is a, a faster, easier way to get what it is they want. And it ends up making their life actually more complicated and takes more time away from their family and away from the things that bring them happiness, true happiness, right? So it's crazy to see all of this kind of on the increase right now. I'm seeing it everywhere. I'm seeing a lot of people fall for it. Again, it just reminds me of how we are living in that time where we have to have that discernment and we lose that discernment when we lose the spirit and things that are causing us to lose the spirit are things that are all a part of that world that are all a part of Babylon. Every time we set aside our principles, our virtues, our values, our beliefs, our faith to attain something of the world, we're basically setting aside God, setting aside the Lord and turning our attention to the adversary, to the things of his kingdom. And every time we do that, we push the spirit away. We push the Lord away. And the further away we push ourselves from the Lord, from the spirit, from the path, the easier it is for us to be deceived and to believe that this other world of illusions and imitations is truth. That gift of discernment is so important right now. It's always important. But if there was ever any time in the history of the world that that gift would be of such great value, that would be right now in this time that we are living in right now, today. And we know that we strengthen that discernment every time we renew our covenants, every time we attend the sacrament and we renew that baptismal covenant, every time we go to the temple and participate in those ordinances on behalf of our loved ones and family members and ancestors. And we're reminded of those covenants that we entered into. We hear the words of those promises that we made, the things that we would do every day, the ways that we would consecrate our lives to the Lord. We're reminded of that in the temple. And when we remember that and we strive to keep doing those things, we are living up to our covenants and we're receiving those blessings. And we have that discernment. We recognize truth from error. We recognize light from darkness. It's a no brainer for us. We recognize a red flag when we see it. We heed to those warnings from the spirit. Well, anyways, I was in church a couple of weeks ago. We had a sacrament meeting that was amazing. In fact, my son spoke at that sacrament meeting. <laughs> he gave a talk and he was told, I think this is a new thing that the church is doing um, where the youth are told, and I think a lot of the speakers are told, you can speak about whatever you want. I think they're being taught to just pray about it and be guided by the spirit and whatever it is the congregation needs to hear. Um, that's going to be what they feel drawn to speak about. And so I think that's amazing. So he decided to go to the For Strength of Youth and he picked a topic. I think it was um, the light of Christ, how to recognize the light of Christ in your life and have more of that in your life. And there were four speakers that day. He was one of them. And it was crazy how they all did the same thing. They all prayed and 
relied on Revelation to determine what they would speak about. And all of the talks went together and created this message. In fact, I wrote it down in my phone. And it was funny how each speaker got up after the other and said, wow, you can tell the spirit was part of this because <laughs> none of us talked prior to this. And it's amazing how well our talks go together and especially the, the order that they go in. It's creating this message. It's amazing. It's beautiful. So I wrote down um, the theme was feeling the love of God in your life, seeing the light of God in your life and how to have more Jesus in your life. It was so beautiful. And one of the speakers that got up and spoke, she brought up how she noticed she was talking to someone or she was listening to a podcast. And they said in the podcast how 2023 seems to be the year of Jesus. It's the year of Jesus. And how that felt right because 2023 is the year that we are studying the New Testament and come follow me. So we are studying all about Jesus this year and his ministry, his atonement, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his return. And so she said, I love that. I'm going to start saying that, that yeah, 2023 is the year of Jesus. Well, as I was sitting there in my mind, I'm like, I love that too. I'm going to, I'm going to start saying that. And as I was thinking about it, it just popped up in my mind how 2023 is also the Chinese year of the rabbit or the hare, H-A-R-E. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I have no idea what comes to mind about a rabbit or a hare. Um, I only knew that and had that on my mind because I had talked about previously how 2024 is the year of the dragon and how that feels very symbolic of the adversary's year, right? So it just really seems like he is gearing up for that year, just with everything that keeps coming out all around us in the headlines and the news, things that keep popping up. It just really feels like the adversary is behind all of that and it's accelerating. We can just see and feel that momentum, but we know that everything that he's doing, he's doing it because he's trying to keep up with and work against what it is that the Lord is doing. So at the same time, we see temples popping up everywhere faster and faster and faster. We see this incredible hastening and momentum going within the church and in God's kingdom. And it's incredible. So we know that's why the adversary is trying to compete with that. And we know, according to the scriptures, in fact, this is something I've really been studying about lately and, and reading. It just keeps falling into my lap and coming across my path. How the adversary just has that time. He has that, that year, that time where he just gears up all of his forces to attack the Lord's people. And we know how that ends. <laughs> we, we know who comes out the victor and all of that. We already know that Christ is the victor. He's already won this, but that doesn't stop the adversary and he wants to have his day. So we know that there will be a day when he gets to have his day and he's going to muster up all of his forces and do everything that he can to destroy the Lord's people and destroy his plan. And we know that right at that time, that's when the Lord returns. That's when he comes for his people and he saves them. And so we know that leading up to that, leading up to Satan's day, his year, whatever you want to call it, that the Lord comes to his people prior to that. And he tells them, I'm here. I'm here. It's the wedding feast, right? There is that union, that celebration, right? So first he comes for his bride. And then he comes to the world. In fact, I'm going to share with you a couple of screenshots from what I've been studying this week that just help add that hope and that brightness to our future of things that we can expect that are on the horizon that are amazing. I keep talking about this in my videos, but I feel like we need that continual reminder, right? To help us keep our head above all of the darkness and the smog. So let's talk about it. So this stood out to me in my reading this last week. Um, he's talking about in this part of the book how it's important to understand the meaning of the word eternal and endless in the scriptures. He says, eternal and endless are not adjectives suggesting that there would never be an end to God's punishment. Rather, the two terms describe God's attributes. Therefore, they are used as titles for God. So what is really meant by those two terms is not that God's punishment has no end, but that it is called endless and eternal punishment because those are his names. 
Endless punishment means God's punishment. Eternal punishment means God's punishment. Now, this is a big focus of the Christian world, of Christianity in general. There's a lot of Christian churches and faiths who focus on this endless and eternal punishment and suffering. And in fact, I saw a video the other day. It was a short video on YouTube of this man standing on a beach and he was, you know, stopping passerbys on the beach and basically telling them that if they haven't confessed the Lord Jesus as their savior, they are going to suffer eternal, endless torment, pain and suffering and damnation. And this approach really turned a lot of people off and they just thought, you know, (laughs) I just, I just can't understand a loving God, you know, punishing his children for all eternity um, and tormenting them and, and having them suffer for all eternity. Um, And, and these people would say, well, that's what the Bible says. So that's how it's going to be. So you better repent. And, you know, I love this approach better. (laughs) I love this approach right here from Gerald Lund where he points out that that is God's name, so it is his punishment. If his children reject the atonement or don't even know about it, and so they suffer for their own sins after this life, they're experiencing that torment and that suffering. But we know that it is the mission of our Savior Jesus Christ to redeem every soul that has ever lived upon this earth. His mission never ends until he has done that. That is his top priority. We know that he saves all of his children. Everyone except for the sons of perdition receive a crown of glory. So we know this. This is what it says in the scriptures. And so we know that even though there will be those who choose to suffer for their own sins, eventually that punishment and torment comes to an end as they choose their Savior Jesus Christ. We know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Savior. Even those who reject him and reject everything and choose um, outer darkness, the small handful of the sons of perdition, Um, Even those who choose it will know that he is the savior, that he could have saved them, but they, they reject it. When everyone else learns that he already paid the price so they don't have to keep suffering for their sins, they receive that. They receive that. And we know that a lot of this happens during the millennium. Those who aren't a part of that first resurrection, they have this time while we are down here on the earth doing all this work. They have this time to continue learning and progressing, repenting and accepting the Lord's atonement. And in the end, everyone is given a crown of glory. Not everyone will have chosen to be worthy to live for eternity in the Father's presence. But everyone will receive some level of glory and light that they feel comfortable with, that they desire. Not everyone desires the same thing, but everyone desires something. Everyone desires some glory, some level of light. So the scriptures would contradict themselves if not everybody confessed that the Lord Savior was their Jesus Christ and they suffered eternal damnation, torment, and punishment forever, and it never ended. That would contradict the scriptures. The scriptures would contradict themselves because they speak of everyone confessing someday that the Lord is their Savior and accepting Him and accepting His atonement. But for those who accepted it in this life, for those who didn't reject it when they heard it, um, the reward is far greater. The blessings are far greater for those children who, who received it right away. They get to be a part of the morning of the first resurrection, and they get to bask in all of the blessings that come with that. Another part that stood out to me in my reading was when Gerald Lund is talking about the signs that the Savior gave so that we might know when to look for his return. And one of the last signs he gives is a sign that he calls the sign of the Son of Man. And speaking of our day, he says, After the tribulation of those days, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And he quotes the prophet Joseph saying, There will appear one grand sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But what will the world do? 
they will say it's a planet, a comet, but the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. So it will look like the sun is rising over the mountain. It will be this bright light and they'll notice it and and it'll be pointed out in the news and media. Hey, there's this bright light coming. It's got to be a comet. And he reminds us with the scripture in DNC. And immediately there shall appear a great sign in heaven, and all people shall see it together. So he says, this is more than a sign that some people see in the sky. All the billions of the world's populations will not only see it, but will see it at the same time all together. The only way we humans can explain how the entire population of the world today could see the same event at the same time would be through a worldwide broadcast over extensive satellite networks. Can you imagine what everyone says when they realize who it is and they realize Jesus really was the Son of God? He really was and is the Savior of the world. Can you imagine those statements and confessions being made on live TV? And in this moment, the wicked are destroyed and removed from off the face of the earth. But now that they know what they know and they have seen what they have seen, they have a lot of pondering and thinking and reflecting and learning and growing to do on the other side while they wait out the millennium. And there will be a lot of suffering, a lot of self-suffering, until they choose to receive the Savior as their personal Savior and Redeemer. And those of us here on the earth during the millennium will be doing their work in the temple. So when the day comes that they choose to receive those ordinances, it will be available to them. So the millennium is going to be very busy. (laughs) We're going to be doing a lot of work to continue building the kingdom of God and bringing all of God's children into that kingdom. And then after the millennium, when they are ready, then they will be reunited with their body. They will be resurrected into their permanent state of glory, which we know will be a celestial glory, but nonetheless a glory and they will be happy. Well, anyways, I'm working on a video right now that I'm really excited about, but it's taking a lot of time because it's a research video. I have a lot of those. (laughs) And I was researching a certain Native American tribe. I don't want to give it away. So just look forward to that video. It's coming out soon. And in there, they talk about in their traditions, this man who visited them from the sky. And they say he was a white man. He came down, he healed their sick, he taught them his ways, he brought them peace and hope, and then he told them he would come back and that they should look forward to and wait for his return. And they refer to him as the rabbit. They call him the hare or the rabbit. And so I'm reading that in this old manuscript from the 1800s, (laughs) just last night, And it's midnight and I am just shouting for joy. I am just ecstatic, but I can't be loud about it because my family's asleep, right? But I am just having this moment where this connection is being made. This is the year of the rabbit. 2023 is the year of the rabbit. It is also the year of Jesus. Jesus is the rabbit. (laughs) In their culture, he is the rabbit. And all of a sudden, I just start feeling it from head to toe. If this is his year then it would make sense that 2024 would be the year of the dragon. And if you understand scripture and how that works out, how the Lord comes for his people, he comes for his bride and so many wonderful and amazing things happen. And the adversary knows it. He sees this happening. And so he comes in to try to stop it, right? To attack it. And before he is able to successfully do so, the savior comes to the world. And at that time, everyone knows that there is a savior, that there is a God, that there is life after death, that all of these things were true, right? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Christ. So if this truly is the year of the Lord, the year of Jesus Christ, the year of the rabbit, then with that comes so many amazing things. It really is going to be an incredible year. 
And at the same time, the adversary is going to be working really hard to take our focus off of that, to put up some smoke and mirrors to distract us and to have us believing differently that things are hopeless and things are beyond our control. There is no hope and this world is falling apart and there's nothing we can do about it. And it's just so sad and heavy. Everyone's passing away and there are so many things outside of our control. We have every reason to be anxious and fearful and depressed and on edge. Don't fall for it. The stronger you feel those feelings creeping in, know that it's because the opposite of that is true. When you feel those feelings really heavy and strong, know that the adversary is working extra hard on you so that you don't notice all of the amazing increase and momentum that's happening with the Lord. All of the amazing things that are happening right now. We used to say, sorry the jets, <laughs> we used to say that those things were on the horizon, right? Those things are just around the corner. They're on the horizon. I truly believe they are here now. They're happening right now. And the adversary doesn't want us to notice that. He doesn't want us to recognize that and see that because then that will increase our hope and it will increase our faith and it will pull us into our Savior, Jesus Christ. It will bring us closer to him. So he's going to do everything he can to distract us and get us to look over here at the sparkly packages and try to bring us into a place where there's despair and hopelessness and anxiety so that we don't recognize what it is that's happening, what it is that the Lord is doing. So we can't fall for it. When you feel those feelings creeping on, when you feel heaviness and hopelessness and sadness and despair and you're alone, you don't feel love, don't fall for it. Don't stay in that place. Refuse to let that sink into your mind. Refuse to let that sink into your heart. Refuse for those feelings and thoughts to take up residence inside of you. Do whatever you can to get rid of them, to get them as far away from you as possible. Sweep them out of your life. Even if you have to verbally say it out loud over and over, I refuse to believe that. That's a lie. That's not true. Things aren't hopeless. I refuse to subscribe to that, right? Whatever it is you have to say, just kick that out of your life. Kick the adversary out of your life. Open up your scriptures, go to the temple. These sound like the standard primary answers, but it's because they are the truth. They work. They are so simple and easy to do that we often just dismiss them and we don't even do them. Go to the temple, open up your scriptures, make sure you're attending sacrament on Sunday. Study the New Testament this year. Immerse yourself in come follow me. I know there's a lot of people who just say, well, I think it's great that we have come follow me and it's great for people who can do it, but I'm just too busy and, and I'm doing these other things that are so good. They're good things that I know the Lord wants me to be doing, but they take up all my time. And so I don't have any time to study my scriptures and do come follow me and, and go to the temple and, and do my family history, right? All of these things that President Nelson keeps emphasizing over and over. We need to make these things our priority right now, right now. Not a few months from now, not next week, not next year, today, right now. <laughs> and um, it's because these things will bring us so much joy. They will bring us those blessings. They will bring us that protection. They will strengthen that discernment. They will strengthen our testimony. These things will bring that power into our lives that will push away the adversary. It is a real power and it works. And the adversary knows that. So don't fall for his lies. Don't think that you don't have time for these things and that you'll do it next year or in a different season in your life. Do whatever you can to make time to be a part of these things, to participate in the things that we covenant to do in the temple. These are those things. We can't just pick one thing and say, well, this one thing is good and it's all I have time for. It's my priority, my passion. It's my own goal that I'm working on. I'm writing this book or I'm, I'm doing this or that, whatever it is. And it's, it's all good. At the end of the day, it's good stuff. So the Lord understands. We have to be careful not to be stuck in those kind of places where we have set the terms and the boundaries for what we think is the way that we are helping build the Lord's kingdom. And, and that's the only way we're going to do it. And that's going to be where all of our focus is. We need to really take our priorities to the Lord and have him help us reprioritize our lives so that they are not out of balance, so that we're not 
doing things in extremes where we're putting all of our time and focus into just one thing. He needs us in a lot of places, doing a lot of things, helping in a lot of ways. And if we let him, he can show us how to do that. He can show us how to make time, how to fit these things into our lives so that we can do his will. Another word that has been coming up so much over the past three weeks is the word scourge. The word scourge keeps coming up in my studies. It keeps coming across my path. And so that's a word that I added to my studies. And then of course, Sister Holland's talk, the minute I listened to her talk, I just wanted to put out a video right in that moment. I wanted to talk about it, but that's not how my life works. <laughs> I have priorities and all of those things come first before making these videos. So just know when wonderful things are happening, I'm watching it just like you are, and I wanna talk about it just as much as you do, and I will get to it eventually. <laughs> so anyways, I remember that night, this alert popped up on my phone saying that there was a young adult devotional with Elder and Sister Holland, and I had no idea till that alert popped up on my phone. So I told the family, okay, turn on the TV. It's in an hour. Let's watch it. So we turned the TV on and we had dinner and then the devotional started and it was amazing. Every word that Sister Holland shared was exactly what I needed to hear. Again, it was all about simplifying, making things in your life easier, making the things that we're doing to minister and carry out our roles in the gospel and, and helping build the Lord's kingdom, simplifying with those things, not making them so complicated. And that if we will just simplify everything in our lives, we will feel like it's possible to fit these things all in a day. We will feel like it's possible to have time to feel rest and experience peace and renewal, right? We can have our cup filled so that we can be strengthened and energized to go out and give more to the Lord. I loved her talk. I loved every word of it. In fact, it was perfect timing being at the beginning of the year when everyone is setting their goals and carrying out their goals for the new year. Her talk was just perfect for that. And of course, Elder Holland's message was just as amazing. Now in my notes in my phone, I wrote, Scourge keeps coming up while I'm reading my scriptures. Big earthquake today, 7.4. That really caught my attention and Sister Holland's talk. And one of my favorite parts from Elder Holland's message was when he said this. Surely this manifestation of his faith, of his hope and charity, comes because he knows the end of the story. He knows righteousness prevails when final accounts are completed. He knows that light always conquers darkness forever and forever and forever. Okay, that reminds me of that part in the movie Sandlot. <laughs> he knows his father in heaven never gives a commandment without also providing the way to fulfill it. A victory makes everyone cheerful. And Christ was the victor in the contest with death and hell. That is heavy theology tonight, but that is what his disciples were to be happy about. Christ triumphant is the source of our hope in this new year and every year forever. Given life's distractions and Lucifer's temptations, staying hopeful and cheerful may be difficult, said Elder Holland. At some point, the hopes and convictions of all of God's children will undoubtedly be tested and refined in the crucible of personal suffering. My beautiful young friends, untested faith isn't much faith at all. We say we are built upon the rock of Christ. We had better be because life has its storms and squalls and a sandy foundation simply will not hold. When the wind blows and the rain descends and those floods come. I love that reminder of the beauty of all of these unanswered questions that we have. Things that seem to really cause people to shake their faith and question and doubt. All of these things such as questions that remain unanswered and things that don't make sense or don't always add up. All of these things that people choose to come in and alter their faith, 
we can see the beauty in that and we can actually appreciate that and say, you know what, because of these questions and these doubts, I'm given the opportunity to use my faith and grow my faith. Because if we had all the answers, if God gave us the answer to every question that we had and everything was laid out before us, we knew everything, we could see everything, we knew that God existed for a fact, He showed Himself to us every day, what would be the purpose of faith? We all came here to learn faith and to use it. So that is the beauty of questions and doubts. They help us learn, develop, and grow our faith. Let's go ahead and roll over right now to screenshots to sum up the rest of today's message. So California has been in the news a lot lately, just about every day. They are just getting slammed with natural disasters, one after the other. As you can see right here, just storm after storm, flooding, landslides, earthquakes, all of it. California is getting pummeled. Now it's interesting because a lot of the headquarters for these companies that are over these industries that are a big part of that great and abominable church, those headquarters are in California, a lot of them in Los Angeles. And it almost seems to be symbolic of the devil's kingdom being shaken up right now. Here's a screenshot on January 8th, a 7.2 earthquake, if I can pronounce it, in Vanuatu. There seems to be a lot of activity in that area. I think right at that time, Representative McCarthy out of California was finally selected and voted in as Speaker of the House. There seems to be some symbolism with that. That kept coming up in my last video. I shared that, that a lot of things surrounding him being Speaker of the House just kept coming up everywhere. There was a lot of symbolism in that. So he finally was chosen to be Speaker of the House. And then we have this huge earthquake, a 7.2, shortly afterwards, and California just being slammed with storm after storm, disaster after disaster, earthquake after earthquake. It seems to be increasing. So pay attention. This image was surreal. Atmospheric parade resumes early. Widespread flooding and damage expected. And all this is headed for California. California flooding threat to worsen as major storm arrives early next week. So of course I took these screenshots as it was happening, moment by moment. These alerts are constantly popping up on everyone's phones. The next day, January 9th, I look at my phone and I see that there was a 7.6 magnitude earthquake. That is huge in Indonesia. Right when I looked at my phone, of course there's that pay attention number 113, 311, 3rd Nephi chapter 11. And again, I'm feeling pay attention. As these things are escalating, pay attention. Here's another screenshot the next day. Half of states, counties declared disaster areas and we can see cars underwater. There were children that were swept away, people who lost their lives in the flood. Another thing that stood out to me is the messages leading up to this and leading up to January of this year were get on the ark. We're boarding the ark. The doors are about to close. The floods are coming. And now it seems like everywhere we look in the news, it's all about floods. That word is popping up everywhere. Floods, flooding, floods. Even in Utah, as we speak right now, it's snowing. <laughs> we have just been getting so much moisture, so much rain and snow day after day, week after week, which has been a huge blessing. And at the same time, it feels miraculous. It feels very divine. So lately when I have a little bit of downtime, I really like to watch videos where people surprise the homeless. They approach homeless people, homeless families, and they surprise them with money. They get them cleaned up. They help them find a job. They get them a house. Just all of these wonderful stories. I love watching it. Even just the simple videos where somebody takes a homeless person out to lunch and just lets them talk for an hour and just listens to their story. I love those videos. and they fill up my cup. They make me really happy. <laughs> so sometimes when my kids have a moment where they're waiting for something or they're impatient or bored or they need to be distracted, I'll pull up some of those channels and we'll watch some of those videos and they just have us feeling so good and so happy. So here's one of those videos that I was watching 
and I looked down and saw my pay attention number everywhere. I used to always say third day power in the 11th hour, but now I'm saying third Nephi chapter 11. These are the kind of people we need to become, the people in third Nephi chapter 11. We need to have our hearts become like theirs. They were prepared and ready for when the Savior came to visit his people. And this is how we do it. Here's another channel, same concept, that I've been enjoying. And he has 1.13 million subscribers. Same with the other channel doing very similar content. He also has 1.13 million subscribers. So there's that pay attention number 311, Third Nephi chapter 11. And then a friend reached out and shared this video with me. She recommended that I watch it. And I looked down and he had 14.4 thousand subscribers. <laughs> so there was that pay attention number 144, which represents the gathering of Israel, which I believe um, that's a big part of the messages that he shares. It's all a part of that gathering. So um, again, pay attention. I love these messages and I love seeing these pay attention numbers. Something else that came up for me this week was this blues singer and guitarist from like the 1930s. He was known as Lead Belly and his name just kept coming across my mind. So I did a little search for him and watched a couple little videos about him. This song that he wrote called Grey Goose just kept coming up everywhere. I just kept seeing it over and over all week long. So I had my pay attention number on it, 144. <laughs> which I always say is symbolic of the gathering of Israel. That's the number in the scriptures that symbolizes the gathering of Israel. And it also seems to always be connected to this younger generation, the youth. So anything that has to do with the youth, I, I always see that number. Um, so I learned that this song, Grey Goose, was very influential for a lot of modern day artists and musicians. And so I decided to look into it. I don't know anything about the song or the lyrics. Um, I wondered what a goose might be symbolic of. And I learned that a goose symbolizes warrior protection and bravery. And that's why there was a goose used in the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. So that stood out to me because I recently did a video last month where I talked about Jack and the Beanstalk and all of the symbolism of that. Here it was again. So there's different versions of this folk song. This one here talks about a Monday morning, and in another version, it speaks about a Sunday morning. So kind of interesting there. And then this one talks about six weeks, six weeks of fallen, six weeks of finding. And so the number six stands out, six weeks of picking. And the one thing they both have in common is they talk about this goose and no matter how much this hunter tries to kill the goose, tries to boil it, tries to, to cook it, however it tries to kill the goose, the goose will not die. And here is a pretty basic interpretation of the song. Grey Goose is a traditional American folk song. Its subject is a preacher who hunts and captures a grey goose for dinner on a Sunday. He tries to kill the goose prior to eating it, but no matter how hard he tries, he cannot kill it. The implication being that he had not properly observed the Sabbath. The various methods the preacher used to unsuccessfully kill the gray goose were in order according to the song. Shooting it, boiling it, feeding it to a hog, cutting it with a sawmill. And it goes on to talk about how when Huddy Ledbetter recorded this song in the 1930s, um, it was believed that he chose this song because the gray goose symbolized the African-American who wasn't able to be brought down. It was a message of perseverance. And I believe in his version of the song, it even mentions the White House. So he changed the words just a little bit. But it's interesting to see how this song has evolved over time and how it's changed as far as its meaning and interpretations. But the theme has always been the same of perseverance and protection. And it reminds me of that scripture, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. As a covenant people, when we are obedient to our covenants with God, we prosper and we prevail. We persevere and we are protected. And then this caught my attention. I took a screenshot. This popped up the other day. 
Pope Benedict says the time of the Antichrist is now. Is the Pope right? Now, of course, Pope Benedict is another person to add to the list of people who have recently passed away. And apparently that was something he had talked about before his passing, that we are living in the time of the Antichrist. He was quoted as saying, As one sees the power of Antichrist spreading, one can only pray that the Lord will give us mighty shepherds to defend his church against the power of evil in this hour of need. So I thought that was interesting. As I was studying about the wonderful things that are to come right now, according to the scriptures, as I was doing my scripture studying, there was a verse that stood out to me about the Lord having another name that cannot be revealed, but we are to know that the name means true and faithful. Here is that scripture in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. There's that number, 113. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So I looked up what names out there mean true and faithful, and this Hebrew name popped up, Emmet, which is a Hebrew word for truthfulness and faithfulness. I just thought I would share that. Anybody out there named Emmett, if you have any children named Emmett, that's an awesome name. <laughs> Anyways, as I'm studying this topic and, and my scriptures and reading in Gerald Lund's The Second Coming of the Lord, which I started a couple of years ago, and I'm finally, I've set it as a New Year's goal to finally finish the book. And I've been doing so much more reading lately, which is why I've had less videos coming out because I'm doing a lot more reading. And I'm reading this chapter right now where it's talking about the resurrection and what the Christian world refers to as the rapture. It's talking about that and it's talking about this great earthquake that happens. The jets are flying over. <laughs> and as I'm reading that, all of a sudden I get this alert on my phone for a 6.0 magnitude earthquake again in Indonesia. And it caught my attention because in the last video I talked about that day with the 6.0 earthquakes and all of the symbolism of the locations of those earthquakes, how everything meant angels. And that day, Trump was in the headlines all day. He, he was front news headlines of, of every news website. So there was an earthquake that day. There was a shaking in the location of a place that translates to as angel. So those three keywords, angel, Trump, and the number six, 6.0. And I, I think I mentioned there were there were a few earthquakes that week that were exact 6.0s. So to me, that was a pay attention. I think it happened three times. I had a six, a six, and a six. Six, six, six. <laughs> and to me, that caught my attention. I, I was being reminded of the sixth trump that the angel blows that pours out all of the judgments upon the wicked. Here I am reading about that very scripture. I'm reading about the order of events, the Lord coming for his bride, and then the resurrection and the saints being caught up to meet him, the earthquake and all of the judgments, the angels sounding their trumps, and all of a sudden here comes the 6.0 earthquake alert on my phone. There it was again, pay attention. And here's what I had just read prior to that alert popping up. It says a great earthquake, perhaps the greatest ever. And this is in Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. So there is that number again, 113. 3rd Nephi chapter 11, and it says, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. So clearly there's a remnant left behind, a righteous remnant. And we know in 3rd Nephi chapter 11, there was a great earthquake, and a righteous remnant was left behind and that's when Jesus appeared. So I wrote that at the bottom. Jesus rose on the third day, and there was a great earthquake. The Nephites felt it. A righteous remnant remained. This is a parallel for our day. 
And then just the other day, my friend shared this with me. This is a screenshot of someone that she knows. It says, Elder Bednar came to speak at our state conference today. Marvelous. I just want to share a couple things he said. Sorry, I'm not the best note taker. He said, in a couple of years, it will not be possible for them to come to state conferences like this anymore because they will be far too busy dedicating temples. He said, we've just seen the beginning of the temples that will be built. He said he didn't have the words or language to adequately describe how 1 Nephi chapter 14 verse 14 is talking about us. He taught about covenants and that the word relationship in covenant relationship would be better described as covenant connection. He said that we would need a covenant connection to be able to make it through the last days, and there was a distinct feeling of this being soon. Those who don't have that connection won't make it. And he said, even if people are good people, it won't be enough. So I shared this with my husband, and he said, I wonder what the difference is between a connection versus a relationship. And I said, well, it makes me think of a married couple. You have a relationship with your spouse because you're married. So you have that relationship. You are husband and wife. That is your relationship. But just because you have a relationship doesn't mean you are connected. You don't feel connected. Sometimes you might feel like two completely different people living under the same roof. And so what Elder Bednar is, is saying is that the Lord needs us to feel connected to him. We need to feel like there's more than just a relationship. We have a relationship, meaning he's our father, we are his children. So we have that father-child relationship. But if we're not nurturing it and, and putting time into it like we would someone we're dating or, or a spouse, right? Then there's no connection. It's nothing more than just a relationship. You need that connection to take it to the next level so that you feel close and you feel united and you feel as though you are one. You're not just two separate people living under the same roof. You're together and you pretty much share the same will. <laughs> you want the best for them. They want the best for you. You both want the best for your kids. And so your goal is to always come together, create win-win situations, right? <laughs> Within your family. And that's how it should be with the Lord. We should always be coming to him, connecting with him and, and working together with him to create these win-win experiences in our lives where we really trust his plans and we trust that whatever it is he's doing or telling us to do, it's going to turn out for the better. So I thought that was awesome. And she shared a screenshot of that scripture that Elder Bednar said that read the scripture and understand that Nephi is talking about you right now. It says, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord. That's us who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is spread all over the earth. We have stakes all over the earth. We have temples all over the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. She said, so if we are those people, and this is happening right now, this is our time right now, then it brings even more meaning to the verses that follow which says, and it came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church. And I'm feeling it, you guys, because um, that's been a huge part of today's video message. It's been something that just keeps coming up on my mind. And this is one of the last things that came to me over the last day or two before I decided to make this video message was this scripture confirming that. So the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. Now I'll stop there. If you want to go read the rest of the verses, just go to 1 Nephi chapter 14, read the entire chapter, but that will help you better understand where we are right now. This is us. This is prophecy 
from hundreds of years ago being fulfilled right now. And we are a part of that fulfillment. And then of course, right after that, there's an earthquake, a 6.3 in Japan. And then this screenshot here, Northern California continually being hit with natural disasters. The wrath of God is being poured out upon the great and abominable church, and his church also spreads all over the world. The adversary has his tentacles all over the world, on every continent, in every nation, in every industry. That is his church. He has an agenda. He's at the top of it. But the Lord is, is pouring out his wrath upon that great and abominable church, and we are going to see it fall. We are about to see Babylon completely fall and we're seeing it in parts of the world where there seems to be a headquarters of a lot of these companies and organizations that seem to be a part of this church right but it is happening all over the world and at the same time the lord's saints his covenant people you and me he is arming us with righteousness and his power all over the world and every time a temple pops up the power of the Lord blesses that area and blesses those people, whether they realize it or not. As I've talked about before, it's just like a chess game. It's amazing to see what the Lord is doing right now. Jets are flying over. And again, instead of spending our time and energy focusing on what the adversary is doing, let's turn our focus and our attention and spend our time and energy on noticing what it is the Lord is doing and how we are a part of that. Three minutes and 11 seconds into my recording right now as I just said that. 311, there it is you guys. Let's choose to be chosen. Let's choose to be a part of this great work. This is it, it's happening right now. No longer is it on the horizon, in the future, around the corner. Let's prepare, let's get ready for these things. This is the horizon. This is that future. We are in it right now. It is happening and it is going fast. Let's stay on the path. Hold on to the iron rod. Stay on the ship. The doors to the ark have closed and we're going to ride out this flood with faith. 2023 is going to be an incredible year if we choose to see it that way. I know that as we continue to keep our chin up, to keep our eyes and our focus on the Lord and on his path, we will be strengthened. We will be blessed. We will experience miracles in our lives as we work on having a deeper connection with the Lord through the ways that he has taught us to do that, right? On his path, through prayer, in the temple, as we work to deepen our connection with him, we will feel his power increase in our lives and we will feel a sense of overcoming the adversary, overcoming our weaknesses, overcoming our fears, anything that's giving us anxiety right now, his power helps us overcome that. His power helps us push that out of our lives. His power helps us keep our head above the water, right? And above the darkness. Let's not lose sight of that. Let's keep that momentum going and every day look for reasons to be joyful and to feel grateful that we're still here. We're still living and breathing. We're still a part of this. We have a purpose. The Lord is using us. Every day, let's choose to be chosen. I know that as we do that, we will experience joy and peace and we will start to see the glass half full instead of half empty. We will have that hope. We will be strengthened in our hope. I know that's true and I say it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you have a wonderful 2023 <laughs> and I will see you next time.